Hi, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us today. After 10 years of drug addiction, Wayne Bradley was barely alive. He was emaciated, he was shunned by people, even living under a bridge. Well, Wayne was also snatching purses to feed his addiction until the day one of his would-be victims shut him down. When you get down to 90 pounds and a shoestring around your uh, waist for a belt, when people lock their doors, when they see you, when you've given up, there's only one thing left, and that's to die or make a new um, approach at living. And I was just tired, man. I was just tired. Wayne Bradley's story begins over 50 years ago in his home on the south side of Chicago, where he was physically and verbally abused by his father. You were always guessing, always guessing what you would, you know, what kind of reaction you would receive. Um, there was always um, the fear, I think, would have permeated the air more than anything else. Embarrassed about the abuse, he told no one and soon became a loner. I was always scared, um, always um, shame. I was always, um, I think that even in the pain and in the times that I was hurting the most, I was always afraid that something would happen, that um, something would happen because I knew even at that early age, I knew that it couldn't go on like that forever. Uh, and I just was always afraid that something would happen. And I did. Did. After high school, Wayne joined the Army and served four years. For the next 16 years, he worked as a trucker and then as a security guard. But drugs and alcohol were a constant problem. I think the main reason I was an addict, I used so many drugs, is because I was trying to hide. I was trying to hide from, not only from the things that had happened in my life, but I didn't want to face me. I was a user and abuser of people. Everything that happened to me, I did to someone else. Um, I was not good news. I was not good news. And um, from military to 96, I was, a, I was a mess. That mess was about to get much worse. It was April 1996. Wayne went to see his parents, only to find them dead in their home. Both had been brutally stabbed and beaten. Then he learned the killer was his older brother, Craig. It became probably the biggest challenge of my life, I'm telling you I was totally messed up and I was strung out on all kinds of drugs and alcohol. I was mad at, at my family, I was mad at my dad, I was mad at God for putting me in such a screwed up family. Wayne lost his job, and over the next 10 years, he became emaciated, shunned by people, and barely alive. And ultimately, it ended up with me living under a bridge in homelessness and addiction. And I had submitted my life to that. Wayne became a purse snatcher to support his addictions. One time at a bus stop, he saw an older lady who was a perfect target. And I'm looking at her purse, and, and she's looking at me, and she just said, young man, no matter what you do to me, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And it kind of just like somebody threw a brick in, in my face because Jesus loves me. And um, she said, let me show you something. And she pointed at a, at a cross and it was up in the sky and it was like 40 by 40 foot cross in a place called Victory Outreach. And she said, we can, they can help you if you will let me take you there. Wayne agreed to go with her. I was tired of hiding. I was tired of running. I was tired of getting high. I was tired of being scared. I was tired of lying. At the church's recovery home, the people treated Wayne like family, and he learned about Jesus Christ for the first time. What I really learned was that he was real. I saw him in the people who accepted me, and at my worst, who loved me unconditionally. Wayne had a glimpse of what could be, but his addictions were stronger than his will to get better. Eight months later, he was back on the streets looking for his next fix. In 2007, Wayne went to prison for larceny. Purse snatching had finally caught up to him. 
And when I got to prison was when I really found myself alone. And, I'm, and you know what I mean? Where I didn't have anything else but God. And I got my hands on the Bible and I was reading and I was finding out more and more about Jesus. And I realized that I was right where God wanted me to be. And uh, that's when I gave my life to Jesus. You know, I started getting a personal relationship with Jesus and I wanted more. After serving nine months, Wayne was released from prison. That same year, he married Jackie. God changing him to be a man who is um, confident in who he is in God, as a man of God. And when he speaks to you, he speaks to you from his heart, looks in your eyes, and you can just see the pain, the sadness is gone, and it's been replaced with a peace. I've forgiven my brother for the crimes, for the murder of my parents. Um, we, we talk now. He calls, um, actually just called the other day. Um, he calls on a regular basis. We write to him. We send him things that he needs. Together, Wayne and Jackie founded I Can Celebration Ministry. Sometimes that's what has to happen in order for God to get your attention. He's got to get you somewhere where there's no distractions, where there's nothing else but you in him, and that's what he did for me. Wayne has been clean and sober since 2012, and he now has a new perspective on his struggle with anger. I thought I was mad at people, even with my brother with the murders. I thought I was mad at him. And all this time, I've just been mad at God because he never did things the way I thought he should. But now, <laughs> I understand why God did things the way he did and once us his grace. He's taking us through something to get us to something. But I'm gonna pay attention to Jesus when he shows up in my life. I'm gonna pay attention to him. You know what I mean? And, and, and here's, the, here's the good thing. Jesus will go anywhere. And he'll meet you wherever you are. Wow, hear that profound truth that Jesus will go anywhere. It's so true. You just saw it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You just saw it in Wayne's life and story. He was in jail. He was broken. He was run down. He was tired of lying, stealing, doing drugs, living a dark lifestyle. Oftentimes we have this misconception of God that we have to be perfect that we have to be like the perfect child before he could ever love us, before he could ever help us. And that is just simply not true. Jesus will go exactly where you are. He wants to meet you exactly where you are, where you are. If you're in a jail cell, if you're, you're in your home alone, you're in your bedroom alone, you're in just a, a dark place in your life, and you don't see a way out and you're confused <clears throat> and you're angry with God, just like Wayne was because of things that happened to you or others did to you, things that happened in your past, choices that you made, mistakes that you made that you regretted. God sees it all. God sees it all. And yet he still chooses you. He still reaches out his hand for yours and invites you into an intimate relationship with him. And it is in that relationship, just like you saw in Wayne's life, where things start to transform. Your life begins to transform from the inside out. The Bible says it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. What exactly does that mean? That means it's not God's wrath. It's not his anger. It's his love. It's his kindness. It's his mercy where he invites you and me to live a life with him, to turn from our wicked ways, to turn from this sinful, dark life, to throw it away, to say, I don't want to live that life anymore, Jesus. I want to live my life with you. That's what that means. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance, that leads us to turn to him. Because the moment we turn to him, friend, he is right there. 
He is ready to embrace you, ready to welcome you home. So if you want that today, if you want to, to live a changed life from the inside out, and sometimes your circumstances might not change immediately, but something inside you does, your heart changes, your mind changes, the way you look at people changes, the way you even look at yourself changes. You have peace for the first time ever. If you want that today, pray this simple prayer of repentance, of coming back to your heavenly creator, of inviting Jesus into your heart like never before. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Lord, I am a sinner, but I believe that you died for sinners. So Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me and my sins and the sins of this world. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you resurrected three days later and that same resurrection power now lives inside of me. Lord God, I turn, I choose today to turn from my wicked ways. I renounce Satan and all of his ways, the things that I have been doing unknowingly in his name. Today, I choose you, Jesus. I choose your name. I believe in you, Lord. I surrender my life, my heart, my soul, my spirit, and my mind, God. I choose you today. Cleanse me, make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now, Father God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you, you have done for me. Thank you for keeping me. You have kept me all these years, and I believe you will continue to keep me as I trust in you, as I put my full hope and faith in you, Jesus, and in you alone. Thank you so much, Father. I love you, Jesus. In your name, I pray all this. Amen and amen. And Lord, I just lift up my brothers and sisters who just prayed that prayer, God. I pray right now in your name that you just touch them, God, that there is a tangible presence and it is your presence, Father God, that is surrounding them, that's touching them, that's healing them right now from addictions, from any, any bondage, anger, unforgiveness and bitterness. Lord, I just pray that you lift that off of them right now as they encounter your love like never before. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen and amen. Hey, if you just pray that prayer with me, please do one more thing. Give us a call at 1-800-700-7000. We've got some awesome free resources that are going to help you on this new faith journey that we can either mail out to you or we can send them to you digitally. And also, if you just need any more prayer for anything at all, please give us a call. Our prayer center is open 24-7, 1-800-700-7000. God bless you. Andrew. Well, thanks to folks like you, CBN's Operation Blessing has been providing relief for refugees who have fled from the devastation of the war in Ukraine. And one woman who's received help from Operation Blessing is now using it to help others as well. Before the war in Ukraine, Marina was active at her church. Her family stayed busy meeting the needs of their community in many ways. There were four villages where we preached God's word. We had a big kids ministry too. When the war started, Marina and her family were quick to help people in their community while facing danger themselves. My parents delivered humanitarian aid to people. We sat in the cold basement and listened to the shooting outside. We didn't have gas, light, or water for about two months. After listening to almost constant gunfire and explosions, Marina decided to flee her home for the safety of her family. It was difficult to get here with the children, not just physically, but mentally as well. After we sat for weeks under bombardment, where they were shooting and the children were crying constantly, we were all exhausted in every way before our journey even began. Thanks to the support of Operation Blessing donors, we gave Marina boxes filled with groceries. With this food, Marina fed her own family and even helped other displaced victims who didn't have access to kitchens. When they brought us groceries today, we had very big eyes. We were shocked and filled with happiness and joy. All this time I was depressed and felt so useless to anyone. 
When you helped us, I could help others again. I was very happy. And I understood that God hears everything and knows everything. Operation Blessing donors are providing victims of war food and the very important gift of hope. I sat in a cold basement for weeks. My baby cried every day. After our meeting yesterday, I flew on wings of joy. I thank God for you, for helping those who have helped others. I am very grateful. What these families have faced in Ukraine and Poland each and every day, no gas, no electric, no water often, hearing bombs go off, children crying, it's so traumatic and, and so dangerous in many instances each and every day. And you hear that lovely woman saying, you have brought me joy. My eyes literally brightened and widened when I saw what you were able to do for me. And now she is still able to help others, which is what she loves to do with her life. Thank you. We want to say thank you to CBN partners who have made actions like that possible in the name of Jesus. And we continue to do it. And when you join the 700 Club, you make things like that possible. If you'd like to become a CBN partner, just call 800 700 7000 and say yes i'd like to be a member of the 700 club it's just uh, 65 cents a day 20 dollars a month and you're making a tremendous difference in the lives of so many literally people living in horror and trauma and emotional and physical need and you're bringing them joy being the hands and feet of jesus so again if you're a cbm partner we want to say thank you if you're not give us a call 800 700 7000 ashley well, T-boned by an 18-wheeler. When EMTs arrived at the scene, they expected the driver to be dead. The 23-year-old was alive, but just barely. So what helped his parents hold on to hope? A fourfold promise from God. June 24, 2016. EMT Greg Clark and the Fort Worth Fire Department responded to an accident involving a car and an 18-wheeler. We were first ones to arrive, and sure enough, a large truck T-boned another vehicle, hit him in the driver's side door. My immediate thought was, it's probably going to be a body recovery, not a rescue situation. Amazingly, they found the driver, 23-year-old Charles Priest, unconscious but alive. He was airlifted to Texas Health Fort Worth Hospital in critical condition. Moments later, his mother, Cherie, drove up on the accident. It, it was unbelief. What am I looking at? What am I saying? Is, is this really him? At that point, I think all the emotions turned off, and it was the matter of, you got to get to your son. After an officer filled her in, Cherie went home and picked up her younger son, Texas, and husband, Chuck. Speeding towards the hospital, they prayed. OK, God, what's going on? You know, is he going to be OK? I was just praying that, it, that God was going to be in the midst of it. When the family arrived at Texas Health Fort Worth, they learned Charles was in a coma. Dr. Mohammed Siadati was one of the medical staff caring for Charles. CAT scans revealed severe head injury, neck injury, broken ribs, blood in the chest, broken pelvis. His head injury was the most severe one and there is micro tears, it's damage at cellular level that not necessarily obvious. To see your son lying there and not know if you would ever see his eyes open again and not know if you would ever hear him talk again, it was just overwhelming, heart-wrenching. Although hoping for the best, doctors could make no guarantees. And it was those kind of things. If he survives, if he wakes up, and we don't know when, and there's nothing, and there's no way for them to predict what's going to happen. As the staff worked round the clock, friends and family gathered to pray, holding on to hope. I may never get to speak to him again. I, I may never get to see him again. We may never get to laugh together again. Thought I was about to lose my son. After three days, it was clear Charles would live, but he still faced the possibility of several permanent disabilities. His fractured neck might require surgery, severely limiting his mobility. But doctors' main concern was the elevated cranial pressure. The longer it remained, the more brain damage it could cause. His parents feared their son would never be the same. 
I mean, there was absolutely nothing we could do um, except for praying and, and, for, and trusting in the Lord. Pleading with Father and asking Him to, 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 to allow us to have another day to play basketball. Alone in the waiting room one evening, Cherie says she was praying when the Lord gave her a promise. I was sitting in the waiting room and I was looking out the window. I saw a dark cloud out in the distance. When I saw that cloud and he took me back to Psalms 18. And it's just a beautiful passage. It starts out with my cry came to the Lord's ear and he heard me. The next several verses describe nature responding because he got up and he came to my rescue. And the Lord gave me those four things that he's gonna wake up. He's gonna know who God is. He's gonna know who our family is, and he's gonna run. A week later, Charles' cranial pressure stabilized, and the doctors took him for an MRI. The family waited for the results. They said, what we expect is for his brain to look like dog food. And then they put the images up on the screen, and the image of his brain is a healthy brain. And the doctors were surprised. They didn't expect to see it intact that way. Over the next several days, Charles started waking up from the coma, responding to verbal commands. To the staff, it was a great improvement. To the family, it was confirmation that God was answering their prayers. The doctor would come in and say, we're going to do a breathing test, but don't, don't be shocked. It's going to take him a while. And in a couple of days, he's breathing on his own. And within a week, he's eating solid food. Only six weeks after the accident. He exits the hospital walking. Then after wearing a neck brace for four months, he was released by doctors with no surgery and no medical restrictions. So when it was done, it was done. I was the last part of my recovery. And for me to walk away from that with no restrictions, there's no way that I can look at any of the stuff that happened to me and realize it's not a miracle. Charles not only finished his college degree, he was deemed physically and mentally fit to pursue his dream and serve in the Texas National Guard. God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. And if I doubt that, all I have to do is go look at my son. He's not good because of the healing. He's good regardless of whether or not my son was healed. He revealed himself to us in this, and all I, all I can do is say thank you. Wow, sometimes those stories just leave us speechless. I'm sitting over here saying, this is crazy. This doesn't make any sense in the natural. But we just thank God that he is a good God. Just like Charlie's mom said, he's good regardless. God is good regardless of whether or not we get the outcome that we want, such as healing. But we believe that God is good and He wants to heal you. He wants to heal you just like He did Charlie, a full recovery. You look at Him now and you're like, is that even the same person who we just saw in that hospital bed with tubes all over and down into His throat? I, it just doesn't make sense. But here's the thing, relying on God is the best place to be in because you're putting your hope in your creator. You're putting your hope and your faith in your savior. And we believe God wants to heal you today, to touch you today, to answer prayers today. So Andrew and I are gonna pray for you and your needs. But before we do, we just wanna to continue to ignite your faith with some more amazing miracle stories. This comes from YouTube. This person said, a while back, I injured my right wrist. Anything I did was painful. I went to the ER and was given a splint to wear and pain medicine. There was a camp meeting nearby, so I went and asked God to heal my wrist. They had a prayer line and said that God's word says to let the elders lay hands on you and the power of God hit me. The next day I realized all of my pain was God. I know God can heal you at any place where you are. He is my healer. Amen. That's Amen. Here's a report kind of similar to the story we just saw. A viewer on YouTube said, I was recently in a horrible car accident where the car was totaled. 
with God's protection, I was able to walk away from the accident without any injuries. Praise the Lord. We're Praise so Lord. encouraged to hear that. Yes. Ashley and I are going to pray, as she mentioned. Ashley, yes. would you lead us? Would you start yes, our prayer time? Yes, absolutely. Lord God, we just thank you so much. We just thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are who you say you are, which is I am the Lord God who heals. You love us, God. We stand firm on that promise that we are children of God. And whatever we ask, you will answer. So Father God, we lift up everyone who's asking for a physical healing today, that you would touch them, that they would feel your presence and that pain would be gone. They wouldn't have to suffer anymore with any of the conditions they've been uh, given from the doctor. Lord, we, we believe in your report, which is healing from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet in Jesus' name. Andrew? This isn't about physical healing, but there's, uh, I believe, a young woman who's being pressured or considering getting involved in witchcraft, of all mm -hmm. things. I think it's some sort of like pressure from your peers, your friends. Um, and it's just this leaning, people are leading you toward like a witchcraft and getting involved and trying this out. And your spirit is speaking to you not to do that. You feel that resistance, and that is of God because where you're being led is not of the Lord and the Holy Spirit inside you is keeping you from that. So be obedient to the voice of God, he loves you. Yeah, I believe there's someone watching who's fairly young to be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. You are very confused by this, but you just got this diagnosis. And again, you're young and the doctors are, are also surprised that you have this, but don't receive that. Don't receive that report from the Lord. I just believe God is touching you right now and the pain and stiffness in your hands and joints and ligaments, I believe is going away. God is touching you. He's healing you 100%, not just 50%, 100 you're going to go back to the doctors and the tests will all come back saying that you don't have that because you don't. It doesn't belong to you. God is healing you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Someone, another young person who is at home, they're supposed to be at college. They had big plans and a life at school and they have failed out and are at home and just feeling life has crumbled and you feel alone and the Lord sees you. He's going to rebuild what is around you and do not lose hope. The Lord has a plan for you in Jesus name. Jesus name. Amen. We leave you these words from Mark chapter nine, verse 23. Everything is possible for one who believes. Amen. Amen. And we'll see you tomorrow on 700 Club Interactive. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Hey everyone, I'm Ashley Key. Thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so we can reach more people with encouraging content like you just watched and so you never miss a beat. See you next time and God bless.